All right, so we are uh, sharing the screen. We've got the audio recording, and we'll pull up the slides. So tonight, um, as heavily anticipated, we're going to talk about data cleaning, which will be relevant for your project one. Um, some of you got feedback on that uh, as far as resubmitting. I did open up Blackboard to submit another proposal version. So if you can do that, um, that'd be appreciated. Let's see. So we have a lot of content tonight. Uh, we're going to have in-class activities. So the content that we don't get to, I'll make available uh, as uh, some, some backup slides available on Blackboard and also probably some recorded content later in the week. Uh, so if we don't get to everything, don't you've missed out too much. All right. So again. Absolutely. Correct. All right. So, so the first activity to get you sort of like discussing the homework was to uh, find a partner, and I'll be a signing partner shortly. And then we're going to open up the week three submission and talk with your partner about what you did, what they did, and then go back and forth on that. So, uh, let's see if I can pull up the notebook. Bad response. All right. Once Docker starts for me, uh, it's maybe a minute. All right. If the, so, Docker takes a little bit to start up. From, there we go. All right. We will get you a partner. <laughs> Okay, take one more minute and we'll come back. Okay, let's come back to our desk and we'll review as a class. So th my, my little pet theory is that I'm probably not actually the smartest person in the room, but the collective intelligence of all you, that is greater than what I can offer you. And so like my hope in these exercises is that by talking with randomly assigned people, enough times you'll actually find someone who helps you with the little bit that Ben didn't give you. So I can't satisfy all your needs, but someone in here talking about different things can. Um, so hopefully we find these useful. If, if you have feedback about these specific types of activities that are like detrimental or harmful, let me know. But I think they're, they're helpful sometimes. All right, so I'm going to cover a couple notebooks and sort of point out the things that I saw. Um, so there are mainly two, two primary approaches, right? One where someone came up with the random data themselves, or the other where they used a library called Faker. Either of those is totally cool. They both represent different types of work. Right, the person inventing the random data from scratch, they have to do all that work of creating the random data. The person using Faker, which sounds easier in some sense of reusing someone else's code, now they've taken on the burden of having to learn how to use that library and how to implement it to get the thing they want. So in either case, I don't feel bad. Right, Either approach is totally fine. They represent almost equivalent types of work, or sorry, different amounts of work. Um, and so it, let's, let's take a look at one of these here. So this person. Uh, talked about what it is that they're accomplishing in the notebook. They imported a couple libraries, random string and CSV. The thing that I'll, I'll reemphasize repeatedly is they're using little cell blocks to execute code. That's useful because then if there is a problem, I can go back and debug, like, what's wrong with this function, rather than a giant block of code. Right. If you have comments, I'll, I'll share them with the class or hold them until the end. Uh, so there's 
little snippets of documentation explaining what it is they want to do. That's very nice. Um, and they walk through. A little tip here, if your cell block is larger than the screen, you should probably split it into separate cell blocks. Right? And, and the reason for that is like visually, your human mind has a trouble folding all that text in your head. I'm not sliding any of you. You're all smart people. That's how you're here at UMBC, right? But the problem is, like, when your cell box get larger than a screen, it means you have to memorize all that content. That's hard. So it's easier to just look at it and debug it in little sections. It's called literate programming. If you're curious about the design. All right. So they go through. Basically, they did all this work. This is super intense, right? They figured out the math. They wrote the code. Cool stuff. Then in the end, they're going to take all these functions. And they have this, this one giant function, which combines all these things and writes it into a CSV directly. So that's, that's pretty uh, neat how they did that. And then they're just writing the rows to the CSV inside their loop. So they skipped over the idea of using pandas, which is also totally cool. Pandas is, again, a convenience function. It sort of wraps things up. But then they did this direct into the CSV. Totally cool. All right. Then, obviously, here's another homework where they did use Faker. They imported that library. And then, basically, they wrote uh, a CSV. Again, same sort of design where they're doing the entries inside of a loop inside the CSV writing. And they're calling Faker directly. Okay, questions on that? Pretty straightforward design. Um, and this is, yeah. Yeah, so same thing. All right, so those are the two designs. Anybody have comments on the homework questions about that? All right. Yeah, so then we're reviewed. All right. So I'm going to give a little bit of scope on, like, what does cleaning mean to me? All right, so there's – so cleaning data sounds like a relatively sort of, like, messy job, and it is. There's lots of aspects. And the main point that you'll probably walk away tonight is you'll be cleaning data – and then you'll get what you think is cleaner data. And then you write some analytics against that data. And then you realize in the course of writing those analytics that you uncover yet another aspect that needs to be cleaned. It's that iterative loop back and forth about, I'm cleaning the data. I write an analytic. Analytic fails because it choked on something that I didn't expect. I have to go back and clean. So just That's the whole loop. But inside that loop, there's a lot of things that we can know ahead of time to look for. So if we sort of like go down this, think of this as a checklist. You're developing a checklist of all the things that you'd like to look for. Because sometimes the things that are going to be, uh, that should be cleaned, won't necessarily trigger an error in your code, but will still produce the wrong output. Those are the cleaning tasks that are more dangerous. Right? Things that you don't necessarily trigger an error on, but still cause the output to be wrong. Those are the things that we develop checklists for. All right, so <laughs> this is sort of what I think you'll walk away technically with, but I was just sort of explaining the concepts. All right, and then so this relates back to the project in the sense that let's say you have a perfectly clean data set, and you don't need to do any Python cleaning of that data. It's perfectly clean. You write analytics. You do your visualizations. It's all good. Great. I still want you and your project to demonstrate why you know that data is clean, not just because you looked at every entry and they're all numeric, but like you ran some Python code to show that that column is numeric. So that's what I'll be looking for in the project, to sort of document the action that you clean the data or the inaction that you didn't have to clean the data because of some claim that you're making. All right. And then this is, like again, sort of like a meta point. It's not worth cleaning your data if your customer doesn't care. And then this sounds sort of obvious, right? But so many people invest a significant amount of time cleaning data, getting data, and then like making pretty pictures and writing reports and then emailing their bosses and they're not getting promoted. And just like, why, where did I go wrong, right? Did I not clean the data well enough? Like, no, it's because your customer didn't care about the thing you were working on. And so this gets back into like, what is the relevance of fake data? Fake data can help you because fake data is inherently as clean or dirty as you want it to be. And so if you had clean data and you wrote a report and you said, this is the type of thing that I expect to get, take that to your customer, validate their opinion and the value of that. Then you can go back to the real data and invest your time in cleaning it. Right. Or another approach is like, if you don't actually have the data and you want to try cleaning it, you can make fake data that it's dirty, but it's a little less common. Yeah. Has anyone here done this? Of like their customer, 
and the customer gives them the feedback, this wasn't useful, go back and try again. One, what was your what's your story on that? So how much time did you invest in that initial effort? Okay, so, so two weeks of your time, then you took it to the customer and the customer said, go back. How did that feel? <laughs> well, you're getting paid for two weeks though, right? I mean like, <laughs> but it does impact your, your reputation, right? You wanna make that first impression with your customer very solid. This is a, a problem that I still run into all the time, even though I've been hit by it many, many times. Right? So like someone hands me an Excel spreadsheet, I, I just as a human, sort of implicitly assume that that data was their best effort and is correct. <laughs> it's almost always a bad impression, like a bad assumption to make. Um, so you have to like, when you're cleaning your data, don't think of it as a source of truth. Think of it as like some mistake that someone made and you're there to either like fix their mistake or figure out why is the mistake being made in the first place. I don't assume that the data you're handed is correct. They didn't know how to collect it. They didn't know who to talk to. Right? They're also humans and they make mistakes. And so just because someone gives you a CSV doesn't mean that it's the truth. Yeah. And then like, <laughs> all right. So that was my sort of broad, broad overview. Uh, this is uh, a very sort of quick dive into a topic that I think some of you have already encountered on file encoding. So has, have any, has anyone here seen text that looks like this? Got a couple head nods. So, so this is like, well, I, you know, it, it seems unlikely that the author was intending to do that, right? So it's, it's, or, you know, maybe they shipped me the data and the email got corrupted on the internet and therefore it's not running correctly. Like who knows what's going on there, right? So this was sort of two questions. What's the underlying cause and what do we do about it? Right. So, so in this in this specific example, what the author was intending and what got displayed were two different things. Right. And this so the, the the deep technical reason is that inherently computers operate on ones and zeros. And all the things that you see, the pictures, the videos, the sounds that you hear, the text, they're all those ones and zeros. And so the, the messy part is about those ones and zeros. What is the translation to the thing that was intended? Right, so you can think of, I've got this sequence. Does that represent an A or a B or the color blue or something else? Right, and that's where we get into the sort of like, humans make conventions and those conventions aren't always consistent. So one convention that, I mean, Americans are very biased and they just think in terms of A through Z and zero to N and then like a special character like a curly bracket and a, you know, that's enough for everybody, right? Americans are very picketed like that. So go watch out. So this is the first thing that Americans came up with. They said, we have a certain representation and these are the characters that we'll want to encode as ones and zeros. And so that's sort of like, one of the more common representations of the ones and zeros gets decoded as ASCII. And, sorry? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so the reason that ASCII is sort of like a popular standard for us is because it's very concise. You, you don't need many ones and zeros, and those in computer terms are expensive, so you wanna have as few of those representing a character as possible. Now when the internet got popular and they said, well, Maybe we want to expand to more than just the A through Z, zero through nine, and a couple of curly braces and square brackets. Um, and then they said, well, we're gonna need more ones and zeros to represent those additional characters. And so then we develop more standards to represent those different conventions of how to decode ones and zeros. Which sounds reasonable, but this is where your problem comes in. And so now it becomes a question of which coding standard are you using? the ASCII or Unicode or UTF-8, right? And for your purposes, you probably don't care that much and you know, as long as it works. And so this is like our first sort of cleaning step. What is the character representation being used for our file? Because if you're decoding the text file as ASCII, but it's actually Unicode, you'll get a bunch of what looks like garbage out. Right? So that's, that's why it's relevant to you in a cleaning sense. 
So then we get into the obvious question, well, how would I figure out which encoding standard is my library using? Well, one way to go about it is just sort of like randomly try different coding standards and coding standards, right? So like here's some popular ones I found on Stack Overflow, right? And then you just pop this into your pandas read CSV and see if it works, right? Sometimes that's sufficient and that's all the troubleshooting it's necessary. But pull up uh, another notebook, right, kill this one. So there's, I'll give away my secret. There's actually a library which, uh, can detect which character set a file is using. Bring it over to. So basically, the, the, the key takeaway for this notebook is going to be if you run into a character encoding problem in your notebook that you see some characters being rendered wrongly, this would be a method for figuring out what the right encoding is. All right. All right. So uh, a quick tip on when you're reading files, there's basically two different ways to read a file in. One is just in R, R mode, text mode, and the other is read binary. So we'll see what the difference between those are in a moment. All right, so I'm going to use the, the pretty standard with open as uh, fraw. So I'm saving a handle to my file with the name fraw. And then I'm just going to use the read function on that handle and store the output as file content. OK, so then what it does, what, what you get in the content of that variable is this uh, binary a string of characters. So going back to this difference here, so it gives you, not binary, sorry, bytes. So it gives you the, the basically the raw string uh, from the text file. And that's useful because then we can ask for that raw string here, what is the expected character encoding type? And so I can use the our debt library and figure out what it is the content. Here's S. So that was easy. Right? And then <laughs> this is my own sort of exploration. If you read it in as just R, the Ch Char debt library won't work because you've already interpreted it as a string. And so then Char debt fails. So this is like, why do we care whether it's the RB versus uh, just R? Um, that gives Char debt a chance to figure out what the encoding is. Whereas here, if we just read it in, we're basically saying, please assume that this is ASCII. And then Chargett's like, well, this is already a string, so I can't do anything with it. OK, so that's all I have for now. Questions? Very straightforward. All right, so, so now the, the tip here is like, this is just like when your code executes, that doesn't mean your code is correct. Here, what I'm making the similar claim of if you can load your data into a data frame, that does not make your data corrupt. So, like typically, after you've solved this character encoding issue, you're like, phew, all the cleaning is done. That is not a good attitude to take. All right. So, that was emphasizing at the beginning, you'll iterate back and forth between like thinking you're going to make some progress with the analytics you're trying to write or the report you're trying to generate and going back and cleaning it. That will be an iterative process. Right. This is a little bit out of order. but So now let's say we've got the data into a data frame and we're happy, or at least we think we're happy. Right. So I'm going to iterate through a list of the problems I've seen in data. And these aren't, these aren't, these aren't made of problems, but the, the cause is something I've actually seen in my data sets. So for instance, if you see a candy bar that's worth more than $100,000, that's either a really expensive candy bar or there's something wrong with your data. And same thing for a couch. Right? This is a perfectly reasonable number, by the way. 
but it's usually not something that we associate with a monetary value, right? Fractions of a cent. So we can sort of indicate two problems there. It's not actually an, a number representing money, and it's not a value that you associate with a coach. Right? So again, these are things that a computer would have a really hard time figuring out. And so that your role as a human data scientist is to be the human. Right? You have to apply your human experience and say, okay, that's not a reasonable value, and neither is that for the reasons right, that we just went over. But I would have a really hard time figuring out how to tell a computer that that's not a good assumption to make, given the complexity of the data. Okay, so <laughs> this is one of like 10. So, <laughs> right. so how we might catch that is we'd have to know what the type of things that we're looking at in the column are, and then figure out what the max and minimum are. So in, the, in a few slides, like I don't know, 20 slides from now, we'll go over some notebooks that show how to do these sort of catches. But I'm just saying, like, the error and the way that you solve it is totally a thing that you can do in Python. And we'll catch up with that at the, in a few slides. OK, so this is another thing that uh, threw me off guard once. Um, you're looking at a bunch of uh, arrival times for us, and they're all within like a few seconds. Now, that may be realistic in some cases, right? It could be that you had this whole like string of motor coaches all delivering a basketball team or something, and they all arrive at the same time. That, that's reasonable. Or if you're looking at the arrival times for a city at a given stop, that's probably less likely. So again, getting back to your human intuition of what is a reasonable outcome for the variable that I'm looking at, given the situational data I know. So we can feed the every row of the data. If there is a set of data with yeah. already yeah, yeah. So, so if there's only 28 bus arrival times, you could manually inspect that. But when there's something like a million, it gets harder. And so that's where like the math comes in. So like writing the Python code to look at the variance of a distribution when there's lots of values, that's um, easier to pick out errors in. So, uh, there are set of things we need to look at, or there's something that. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. All right. So, <laughs> this sort of like speaks to my exposure of like how many problems I've seen, right, with the data. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, if you see ages for a list of people that are only 10 or 20 or 30 or 40, then someone did something to your data before you got it. And that's, that's the usual evidence. Or someone implemented some rounding in a code where they should not have. But in either case, it's highly unlikely that you happen to be studying a population of people composed entirely of people with ages 10, 20, 30, and 40. Probably, right? I mean, like, I'm not saying that can't happen. There's certainly pathological cases where that is the issue. But it's highly unlikely that this is the problem. So again, looking at this with a histogram, which I'll explain in a little bit, would catch that pretty straightforward. So inspect the distribution. We'll cover uh, how to do that in Python in a little bit. All right. This is my favorite example, I think, out of all of them. Um, so I given a, a, a data frame with some columns. And some of the columns have subheaders where they're sort of like the units, I think. And then there's some values. So, so from a computer's perspective, this looks like a valid CSV. Yes? Totally good. Anybody have any problems with that? <laughs> okay, so that's that's a claim. You can't have fractions of a horse. Okay, anybody else want to throw out a second one? <laughs> Somebody else have another one? <laughs> okay, so so that could be an issue. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyone want to take another one? There's one more. Or at least from my perspective, maybe from all your perspectives, you have a very different experience of reality from me. Right, so. Well, distance miles, that is a bad American convention to use, but it should be kilometers, right? But <laughs> I was more focused on the fact that we don't measure time in horses. <laughs> right? It's hours, usually. <laughs> or at least I think it's usually hours. So, so either maybe we have a spelling mistake. Maybe we have an alien visitor from another planet who does measure time in horses. Right? And back to your point, I hope for this horse's sake that this isn't the fractions of a horse. Right? It's just disgusting to think about. <laughs> All right. So again. Hard for a computer to catch these types of errors. Perfectly reasonable for a human to swoop in and say, ah, there's something wrong with the data. All right, so <laughs> this is just sort of like an inspection issue. So usually what I try and do is I take the variable names, because very rarely are the columns named in a descriptive format. It's almost never the case. So I usually take the time to figure out 
what would be an appropriate name for this column? Because later, when I'm working with all those different variables, it helps me figure out what the right way to manipulate the data is. All right. So, not to pick on four-legged animals too much, um, but if if you can have you know, fractions of a horse, there's also uh, you know fractions of a cow, and you can have things that uh, exceed 100%, maybe should or should not. Like there are times when you do want to exceed 100%, but sometimes you don't, and whether that is appropriate or not always depends on the situation. Negative lengths, usually not too applicable. Sometimes they are, but very rarely. And again, this one's pretty easy to catch with just maximums and minimums and a histogram. Okay. All right, and then this one we'll also show you in a notebook. Um, so if you have a categorical variable, can, can someone raise their hand and tell me what a categorical variable is? I'll wait. <laughs> Anyone? Maybe like you said, you mentioned a homework event and only work category. Very good. Okay. So another one, maybe a very typical random uh, categorical variable is a yes no response. So usually when you're looking through, you know, a million return, million rows in a CSV, and you see a column that's mostly yeses and nos, it's very useful to count how many unique entries are there for that categorical categorical variable, and usually you'll find like, you know, 500 yeses. Uh, 495 no's and three maybes and another, you know, two sometimes. And you're just like, okay, <laughs> those humans, right? But, <laughs> right. So, so counting the unique number of entries in categorical columns is usually going to show up uh, what the outliers are. All right. So the I think the last couple of slides are on temporal sequences. So. There are some things that we expect to vary in time, like temperature or whether it rained or not. Um, and sometimes these temporal variations have patterns. Like in the day it's warmer and the night it's cooler in a lot of places. Right? Or like if you're measuring the light, it's lighter in the day sometimes. So there are things that should expect to vary over time periodically. This is a future lecture on time series analysis, but just saying there are patterns here to pick out in time varying sequences. All right. So now we have a solo activity for you. Oh, sorry, not a solo activity, a group activity. Which I need a marker. All right. So the first step is what are the types of text variables that we might encounter in our video? And this is a shouted out uh, activity. Anybody think of a string that we might see? Name. Name. Okay. I'm going to count that as a numeric value. Yeah. Oh, it's a string. Huh? Address. All right. Emails. Nice. Get like two more. State. State. Well, we'll put that under address. What's another one? I'm going to count that as an error. Sorry. Occupation. And I'm going to try and get the right. Occupation. So I think I have one more second. Right. So for an email, what type of things should you expect to see in an email? The what? Domain name. Okay, I heard a domain name. What else? Um, something a name then add the name then. So an app, an app, uh, an app symbol. Okay, and something before the app symbol. Yeah. Okay, so the address. Okay. What about uh, for address? What what sort of characteristics would we expect to see there? Okay. Anything else? A space. That's very good. So that's like a good example of something that you shouldn't expect to see in email, right? So here we see like, so these are things that we'll say like are good, and like bad would be like a space. All right. What else would we see in the address? Okay. So zip code. You expect that. State. And so what would we not expect to see in an address? 
Like what? Question mark. Question mark. Question mark. Question mark. All right. <laughs> right. So if you see a question mark or yeah, a, a smiley face <laughs> in your address, <laughs> you're either in a really weird country or you made a mistake with your data. Right. So that's the, these are the again types of sort of features that you'd expect to see in various variables types. Now, if you just said like, is this a, is this email a string? And you got back a bunch of characters, you'd be like, yep, it's a string. I'm done. Right. But maybe you want to filter a little bit more precisely and see other things that you wouldn't expect to see. So again, like if you see a name that has a dollar sign in it, it's either like a rapper, like underground music star, <laughs> or someone made a mistake typing, right? Um, and then like. <laughs> to me, I, I love the categories of yes, no cats. Right? You see that a lot. Um, and then, and then, if I see a list of names, each name may be correct, except for the one that's like a four-foot cable. That's also a name, right, of a thing like a product, but it's typically maybe not the same category of names that we're looking for for humans. And so again, this gets back to it's a totally valid name in a certain context, but maybe not in this list specifically because we're looking at humans. And then like you get sort of like things that are easier to check as long as you think about them. Like if you see a string and another string and a thing that's an integer as a list of names, that's probably not a good thing. Right? So somewhere in your Python code, you may have made a mistake. Um, and then <laughs> again, just like you will see this in real data and it will make you cry, right? So there's like a list of states. Missouri, that's a string, starts with a capital letter. Like doesn't have to make characters. Good to go. Wisconsin, also a state. Mexico. Uh, at least it's not a state of the United States, and so we're probably going to call that one a fall, right? Like, we have an issue where it's a string, it's got the right capitalization, but if we look at our 50 list of the states of uh, the United States, it's not Mexico. So, again, whether that's a real member or not, it's hard to say. All right. So, I hope that you see this in your data for project one. If you don't, that's also cool. Just show me that you didn't see it. All right, so so where these aren't just spread into the data, you know, out of someone's benevolence. They're usually a mistake, right? But what are all the different types of mistakes that we should look for? Just as a data scientist, you'll probably not only be responsible for cleaning the data, but correcting the collection method, right? So this means if there was a web form where someone was entering data, maybe you, the data scientist, start seeing these problems of like yes, no cats. And then you go back to the person who owns the, the web form where people are typing things in, and you say, hey, could you change this from a free text format into a binary choice of yes, no? That'd make my life way easier. So that's typically where your responsibility will come in. You'll be responsible for cleaning the data, but also correcting the data owner for the collection method. So having some idea of like where are these coming from helps. So I'm not going to read this list off, but um, <laughs> these are the different places where you'll probably have to insert your expertise to say, like, hey, you're causing a problem downstream on me, and you're preventing us from doing good work. OK. And then this one, like, is like as a physicist, this is where I said, like, yeah, after you clean all your data, then you might actually find something interesting, mm -hmm. something you didn't know before or expect. And that's where the fun part begins. All right. <laughs> so, so typically, what I've, and I actually saw this in proposals a little bit of, like, hey, my data doesn't look exactly like I want it to. I'm just going to lop off a bunch of data and remove it. Hope that's OK. Right? And it's usually not a good idea, because um, if you just hide a bunch of the, the dirtiness, then you're not really doing the full cleaning, and you may have missed some features in your data. So an example of that is, if I have a list of 1,000 entries, and they happen to be sorted alphabetically, right, and I remove the bottom half, I'm missing a whole bunch of features that maybe I needed in my analysis. So there are good ways of downsampling your data. Removing the bottom half is usually the worst way to do it. All right. Yeah. So if you see one issue, um, that's probably not a, a, a real thing to get worried about. Maybe you can just ignore it. But <laughs> typically, you'll see errors occur in patterns. And then there's a cause that causes those to be a pattern. That's the, the part you want to take away. And then, yeah, so basically what I've sort of not verbalized here is that everything that you do to your data should be documented. So I was going back to, like, you shouldn't just drop data unnecessarily. Be good? Well, hopefully. <laughs> Why do I care? 
The reason that documentation is important is because you're going to do all this cleaning, you're going to make a report, and you're going to make some visualization, and you invested a bunch of effort. But the reason you did all that is because hopefully someone's going to make a decision based on that data. And the level of their confidence about your analysis is sort of helped by the fact that you're telling them, here's all the things I did to get the data to the point where you can make a decision about it. That improves their confidence in using that data for a decision. All right, so this is just sort of like a, a, a checklist. Um, so I'm basically in this whole course, I'm gonna throw at you a bunch of advice. And one way to sort of like respond to that is come up with a bunch of checklists. At the end of class, um, we'll probably develop some checklists of like what were all the things that we learned in this class because it would be very hard to like every time you explore a data set, okay, let's go back over the entire semester of what we learned in data 601. That's unreasonable. But capturing these things into a sort of like checklist of did I do all the things, did I check everything, that'd be useful. All right. So now that we've uh, cleaned the data and we've figured out what the encoding is and we've loaded it, all right, now we have to figure out what is actually the contents, or at least what we think it is. So I'm going to assume that we're in a table. There's lots of other things to worry about. For this purpose of this course, it's hard enough just to work with text in a table. So there are different problems associated with other data formats, and it gets worse. But, all right. So this is something that I've already asked you to do in the uh, homeworks, or sorry, in the project proposal, is to basically tell me how big is your data set? That's a reasonably straightforward thing to do. How many uh, rows and columns, and how big is the file and disk? And this is just very basic metadata. All right, and before I jump into the demos, I'm going to give you a break. And we'll come back, let's see, about 8 PM. Mm -hmm. Guys, are they like stunned silence or really hungry? <laughs> All
reasonably large. All right, so I'm going to uh, use pandas to load in the CSV, which is almost 43 megabytes. And when I do that sort of like the first time, and again, this is a sequence of notebooks I'm going to walk you through. So we're going to run into this and we're going to fix them. I read the CSV off this, and it immediately spits back this huge red thing. And it's like, hey, there's some problems. All right, if you haven't seen those already, don't get worried. All this is, so the, the, the explanation here is that every time you read a CSV in Pandas, Pandas tries to guess what it thinks each column variable type is. And so when you're doing that for a data frame that has hundreds of columns, and each column has something like millions of rows, that gets to be a very intensive operation for Pandas to execute. So it's very expensive. And your, pan and your pandas tries to warn you, hey, this is uh, pretty complicated. So 
um, do you want to do you want to work with this data set or not? And so the the first sort of like a thing that we'll tell pandas to do is like don't worry about it. We've got plenty of memory, right? It's only a 42.7 megabyte file, so we'll just say low memory equals false. All right. Now the the second thing is once we've done that, we no longer get a warning. So I ask, how big is that data frame? And the answer, Panda tells me, is 42,000 rows by one column. OK. That wasn't my expectation, actually, because it warned me up here about the fact that it has something like more than 144 columns. And so like, the fact that it now tells me that there's one, uh, and one column it seems highly unlikely. All right, so I'm going to just look at the head of the file using head. And then I see this. It's like, OK, so what do we? We've got a bunch of column headers. That's so far so good. And there's like this NANS, and there's this blue box, and there's this white box. And I don't know what's going on, right? It's clearly not the thing that we expected. So let's scroll down. OK, we've got a bunch of white space and some more columns. Like, it is it's wacky, right? OK, so I don't think that's right. So, huh? What was that? Yes. Okay. I don't. I think I covered that. But okay. So then, uh, so I'm going to use this head command, which is so. If you haven't seen these before, this is a cell magic. Uh, so I'm taking the exclamation point here to send a command to my computer's operating system. So my computer, being a Mac, has this command called head. And I want to look at the first three lines of the file. And so I'm going to look at the first three lines of the CSV. And what do I notice? Anyone want to guess? What was that? So, so this one here, notes offered by prospectus, blah, 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 blah. And then it looks like a CSV. All right. So we think we've discovered the problem. All right. If we scroll down, all of these, these are the headers for the columns. And then we get into the first row. Of data. So apparently, that first line threw off pandas, and pandas are super confused. And so then we get to our, our second fix. So we we keep the low memory equals false, and we tell it skip rows at the first row. Now my shape of the data frame is way more reasonable, right? 145 uh, columns by four, 42,000 rows. Good to go. So let's <laughs> to say we've started the process of pinning the data. We have a data frame. Okay. So in the future notebooks, I'm just going to assume that that's what we've done and load the data frame in with these little extra commands. And when I time that operation, it takes uh, six, five seconds. So that's a pretty quick, given the fact that it's 43 megabytes in size. So when I start getting worried about like how long something is taking, the first thing I will do is I'll import time, and then run time dot time, which Basically, it starts the stopwatch, and I'm storing the value of that stopwatch to a variable called start time. And then at the end of this operation that took a long time, I'll say stop the stopwatch, get that value again, and then subtract it from the start time, and then print that in seconds. It's basically me timing a camp. I usually don't time all my cells, except for the ones that are unreasonably long, like that one. I get super impatient. <laughs> um, not necessarily all the time, but just for me. OK, so now that we've got a data frame, we want to see for every column, what is the variable type? OK, so now it gets back to you as a human figuring out what's reasonable. Right? ID, being an object, OK, we'll think that's probably a string. Member ID, a float, OK. So why is ID an object and float is a or, uh, so the member ID is a flow like that immediately is like, okay, that's a question, right? So the, this gets into now we're doing data science, right? We have to figure out what's going on there. Loan amount being a float. That sounds reasonable, right? The loan data. So I give you a loan for $500, that'll be a float, right? Something like a numeric value. Who here has not heard of float before? All right, so we have different variable types that are numeric. So integer, int, uh, float. Uh, and those are the two that we'll most commonly run into. So then float 64 is like how many digits of precision are we keeping track of with our numeric data? And I'm not going to, I don't think I can recall all.
all the numeric data types, but float and int are the ones you'll see most often. So, yeah. All right. So then you go down, and 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 what you start to notice is this data has 145 columns, and so manually parsing all this gets unreasonable. All right. So we're going to have to come up with some fun to analyze this data because I just don't want to look at it. And what makes this even worse, pandas went so far as to like trim the number of things that's showing you because it didn't want to overwhelm you. So there were 145 columns. And rather than show you the full list, it said, here's the first little bit and the last little bit. Don't worry about the middle. Right? And you're like, I'm a data scientist. I need to actually see the data. Right, so how do we fix that? There happens to be a pandas command called set option. It allows us to how many rows and columns we want to see. So the first thing that you'll run into when you're exploring big data is probably you actually want to see more than what pandas thinks is safe. And so you're going to increase that limit. So again, this is not absolutely essentially necessary for everything, but sometimes you want to see more than what the, the pandas thinks is safe. So after I, re, after I run these set option commands, now I can see up to 99 entries, or 999 entries. And since there's only 145 columns, I'm good to go. Okay. Still, something I wouldn't want to parse through manually. All right. So we're going to have to come up with some, some actual Python to do stuff. All right. Then I load all my data. Um, so now I want to do the characterization part, right? Now that I'm, I've got some confidence that the data is at least starting to look reasonable. Uh, so one command that I have available to me in pandas is called info. This I usually don't find too useful. Um, it will sort of warn me. If my computer only has like 4 gigabytes of RAM, which it does, um, and I am using a significant amount of that memory, then I have to sort of be alert to that fact and maybe use a bigger computer when my data is too big. Right? And, but in this case, I actually know that my data set is smaller than the amount of memory on my computer. And I think in a future class, we'll actually look on your computer to figure out how much CPU and RAM and disk you have on your computer. So again, going to this big data issue, not all big data fits on your computer. I mean, this isn't even that big, right? It's just 43 megabytes. OK, so then they break it down into quotes and objects. So this is a little bit more concise representation of that whole D types command output that we're looking at. All right. So back to the D types. So you'd be like, OK, a bunch of floats. That's good. I know how to handle numeric data. You got these objects. Those are probably strings to work with. All right, next command that we're going to explore is called describe. So by default, I believe describe works against numeric columns only. So you remember some of the float 64 was a numeric. And so the describe command is kind of useful because it gives you all these different representations of that numeric data, the max, the mean, the minimum. Right? If you remember back to those slides that we were talking about, those are the three attributes that we need to check on every numeric column. So that's like this just answered a lot of those questions. Right? But again, because if we go back to the info, let's see. So we had 115 numeric columns. So what that means is we've got all these statistics, and uh, we lay them out. And if we would have to scroll over and look over all that, and that's just not a real super intuitive way of looking at the data. Yeah, exactly. So, so rather than do that, I think let's do this. I'm going to insert a new cell. So I can do describe, and that that output is a data frame. So all the things that have applied to a data frame apply to this output. So we can run dot t, right? And since we've uh, increased, uh, not working out. Sorry. There we go. Just put everything at the bottom. All right. So. Because we turned on those extra, like, see all the rows and columns in our uh, set, set options, now we're seeing those same statistics, but they're laid out so that I can actually scroll through this a little bit more meaningfully. Right? So again, laying out that table is just makes it easier for you, the human, to figure out what's going on. Maybe scrolling up and down is more native for you. That's how I think. So just something to keep in mind if you really do want to scroll through all these. Now, here's something to think about. Um, 
with this count, that's the number of unique entries. Okay, so look at this count column. We're scrolling down, zero being a unique count. Okay, that's sort of weird. You've got a whole bunch of things where there's as many unique entries as there are rows. So that's something to observe. Right? And then keep scrolling down. Okay, there's another months since last major DROG, zero. There are zero unique entries in that column. OK, so, so now we're starting to pick up some information that might make our job easier. If there is a column that doesn't contain any unique entries, maybe it's not worth keeping as a column. Right, so we'll get to dropping columns uh, later on, but let's see if we can find anything else that's cool. Right, so here, sorry, what was that? Okay. Mm. I think it's the number of unique entries. I think after, yeah, there's like max min. And there'd be two. Yeah. And, and right. So these are blank. Those columns with zero unique entries. Are blank. And so here, there's only 106 unique entries here for that column. So that's cool. All right. So then again, going back to min, those might be useful. All right. So one thing that I sort of like gave a heads up on is describe only applies to numeric values. And so there are other entries that are not numeric that we probably also want to figure out how many unique entries are there, like what's the maximum min, right, all these other things. And so you could go with the describe include all so that it does all the variable types. But that sort of like screws things up. Oh, that was a unique bad. OK, so that's one way of handling it is just do the all variable types. But what you really want is uh, describe for the numeric values and the describe for the object types. Those are the two types of major categories that we have. And it looks like I think I got it wrong. <laughs> Unique shows up as a separate one. I'll have to go back and figure that out. OK. So and you can do the transpose of your data frame and see things a little bit more easily. Yeah. All right. I don't, may not be able to say. All right. So way back at the top, we had this dot info command, and it showed that there are 115 entries, basically columns that are of type float, and there are 30 columns of type object. Usually, an object refers to a, a string, but not always. And, and we can, another way of seeing that same thing in a little bit more verbose mode is to run the D types. And D types will tell you, like, this row is object, this row is close. And so when we're going back down to the bottom here and we're saying uh, describe object, it's saying only the columns that are type object run the describe function on those. Yeah? OK. Mm, I think it can also be like a dictionary or a list. Usually your Python uh, notebooks don't contain dictionaries as an element in the data frame, which is why I'm, I'm defaulting to string as the type, but it's not always. Like you can have a list in your in your cell. Yeah. I may have to revise my statement account if I got that wrong. I'll look back. All right, two more notebooks and we'll back to the presentation. All right, so again, just going back on what we've learned, basically we load the CSV, we skip the rows, we set the low memory false, we increase that. All right, so let's start looking at individual columns. This is where, again, just like in project one, we're going to have to characterize our data. So we've done that sort of generically against the whole data frame. Now we're going to dive into specific columns. So the grade, that column, let's look at the first 10 entries, it's the letter grade that you might receive in this course. Hopefully not E, though. Right. Right. So it's some sort of letter. And so we can ask, of those entries in that column, how many unique values are there? And unique. 
on the column, and it says there are seven. Okay, that's good. Another little handy function that you might find useful is now that I know that there are seven, it's reasonable to ask of each entry type, how many are there of that type? Okay, so there's B is the most popular at 12,000 rows. A comes in at 10,000 rows, second most popular. Right? So you can sort of do this ranking. So this is basically just a series of popularity for each of those entries. Now, the reason I sort of went through this is because you want to validate that there aren't, like, say, 42,000 unique entries in a column before running n unique. So there's sort of an op, there's a set of useful functions you can run, but there's an order to which you want to run them. So if you were to run n unique and you got back something like 42,000, then it wouldn't be of much value to ask how many and how many times does this one come back, right? It's going to be one. How many times does this one come back? One, right? And so like that's usually not useful. So the order matters for these, these sort of analysis. All right, so once we've determined that this column is uh, a set number of, of like seven different entries, what we really want to treat it as is categorical. Right? It's not just a string, it's a categorical data. And so we can use this as type, it's basically changing the data type of this column to be categorical. Another reason that's useful is that other functions in pandas, when you tell them that you're operating on a categorical data, know what to do with that rather than treating it as a string. So this is basically for, for later processing in pandas, it's useful to distinguish between a string and a categorical, categorical variable. All right, so something that you may have seen recently, um, home ownership being rent or own, right? That's sort of expected. So we can go back there, and, and then this is where the data cleaning part comes in, right? So like, again, so let's set a curiosity. E, e showed up and G showed up, so maybe those are valid things in financial circles, I don't know. Okay, home ownership. Um, so we've got five different entries in that category, all right? And like most people uh, own, as I said, and then very few people own, and then other and none. So this is where you, the data scientist, get to go talk to the owner of this data and say, like, what does this mean? Are you, are you getting a loan and you don't own a home? Is that what you mean? Right? And what is other? It's like, I have chickens. <laughs> what does it have to do with the loan? <laughs> So, so this is the part where you have to leave your data set, leave the comfort of pandas, and go talk to people, right? And, and sometimes, maybe you can get away with the fact that there's only eight of these 136 of these, and relative to this, you're just comfortable dropping all this. That's one approach, right? I don't care about the data, it's statistically significant, drop it. But I would caution you that the more beneficial it's, it's worth investing that human time to go talk to the owner to say, like, where did this come from? Because often, like, your most important data science discoveries are sitting down here. Where is this coming from? Why is this anomaly here? Did someone not do the right thing? Is this a mistake? Is this intentional? Is this hiding something else? So a lot of your discoveries will come from those little indicators that there's a problem. And it's very easy to drop those and just say, like, ah, oh, they're small. Ignore them. Right? But those are like the tips. All right, again, those are categorical, so just them as categorical. All right. <laughs> no. So that's a very good question. Do we have to go through all 145 columns? Usually, your story will revolve around one or two or three columns. So like if I want to plot one variable against another, those are the two columns I care about. So, so maybe you want to drop the columns that don't have any data, but also focus on the columns that matter. So that's where understanding all 145 columns is typically not useful. But if I'm looking at loan data, grade, their ownership status may matter. Does that make sense? Okay. So I think this is the last column that we'll dive into. This is super common. You'll have percent signs following a number, which makes them a string. Same thing with dollar amounts. You'll typically see in a CSV, like, you know, dollar sign 105.3. And you'd be like, that's almost a number, dang it. So this is where now your Python skills come into play because you, as a human, 
recognize this is not in fact a string, and it should be treated as a number so you can do analysis on it. All right, so if I try and force this number to be a type float, it's going to give me a, it's going to say value error, blah, 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 what's at, the, what's at the bottom here. Could not convert string to float. So basically, it went through this list, and it figured out that those aren't things that can be converted into numbers very easily. All right, so the trick that I play, if I can make this a little bit bigger. Oops, not that one. No, uh, that a little bit. So what we have is that that column, the rev all util. I don't even know what that means, but I know it uh, should be a, a, a string. So I have to convert uh, that string and remove. I have to replace the uh, the percent sign with a nothing. Okay, so this is like a single quote, single quote with nothing in it. So it's going to replace all the instances where it finds a string in that column with nothing, and then I'll try and convert it to float, which should work. And then when I do that, then I can see that they are numbers. Well, yeah. So what follow-on analysis do you want to do to these numerical data types? That's that depends on the story you're trying to tell. Okay. So I think was it Rahul? Did you ask manually processing all the columns? Yes. Definitely. I am super lazy, and I. Like, I may do this if I only care about three or four columns, but when I have to actually sit down and analyze all 145 columns, I don't do it manually. All right, so how do we, how to avoid that, right? First thing that comes to my mind is loops. I know I'm going to have to loop over the columns. Okay, if I'm looping over something, I want to iterate all the things. That means I need a list of the entries in the columns. Okay, so I, I basically know that I have to, let's see if I can do this. So I basically got, remember when I ran the D types, I got this thing back. This is a series. And the series, these are the values in the series, and this is the index in the series. So I have a list of columns. That's good. I hide this output. All right. So again, I'm, I'm storing the D types output to a series. And then I'm going to loop over. That variable, so that's the series that I just talked about, and the series has values and indices. And so I have to do this iter items to get access to both the index and the values. So here I'm going to call that. I'm going to call the, the left hand side the column and the right hand side the column type. Does that make sense? I've got it. It's not quite a, a list, just has elements that are indexed by 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. A series is sort of similar, except it has an index which in this case is a string, being the column name. And in place of values, it has the data type of the column. Who here has been lost so far? Okay. Yes, this is a series. And so if you go down to the bottom of the series, the way that you can sort of like really validate that, uh, yeah, it just says D type object, but it's not really descriptive. Uh, usually it's a little more descriptive. All right, but anyways, that is a series. And we're going to loop over all the indices and values, which in this case are the column names. Okay, so then I, if, I, if I find that the column type, the right hand column, is object, then I'm going to. How many unique entries are in that? All right. So now we're looping over all the columns in the data frame to figure out for the types. Oops. All right. So remember this n unique. That's saying how many unique entries are there in the column. So we're only going to do that in the case where the type is object. So so this is how we're getting to the patent, the magic of Python to do big data analysis. Right? So, so I don't want to have to look at everything. I'm just going to say the ID column has three unique entries. Right. And this sort of gets back to the the same type of output that we had in that, uh, let's see, in this one. I'm going to try and get back to the describe. Yeah. So now we're sort of like, we're rediscovering how to build this table. That's all we're doing. We haven't done any magic yet. OK, we're going to get to the magic. We're just rediscovering that. So, so what, right? Well, 
Now we can do a little bit more. We can sort of, we can figure out how many unique entries there are. So let's take that same loop, and so I'm basically copying it and adding a little bit of extra stuff. I want to print the first n entries of the list, right, for that column. So let's say I'm going back to every column that's an object. I'm going to say that column has then how many unique entries. And then if I can run this. So it's for that column, I'm going to print that in the entry the rows 0 through 5 in this case. So uh, column with the name ID has three types of entries, three unique entries, and the first five are all names. OK, that's weird. Let's go on to the next one. The column named term has two unique entries, and the first five are 36, 60, 36, 36, 60. Do you see where we're going with this? It's slightly more than the describe function had. I'm going to go back up to here again. So this is just a little bit of code that I wrote to pick out a column type, the number of unique entries, and show me what the first five entries are. So this is a slightly faster way of iterating through 30 different column types. And this this is how I sort of like, so there's always this interest of like, right? but there's some value in just looking through things sometimes. So EMP length. Normally, I wouldn't have any idea of what that means. Right? But if I look at these first five entries, my intuition about what I think this column might be for loan data would be how long have they been employed for. Right? So if the person has been employed for more than 10 years, they're more likely to get a loan. Right? And again, that's something that you would get just by looking at the data, but this is like a quicker Python way of diving into that data quick. Well, Exactly. So, so like this gives us a really clear entry point of suppose the employment length was something I did want to study. Then I would have to reformulate this into a set of categorical variables, and maybe they're just numeric, right? Like a zero for uh, you know less than one year. Like there's some way of binning this into numeric data. So there's lots of ways around this. Yeah. And then <laughs> this is the these are the types of columns that can scare you. So employee title or employment title, right? So that's something about the person's work role, OK? That's typically going to be a hand-entered data. And so if, if your analysis depends on that hand-entered data, it's going to be a mess to clean up. These other ones, my guess, if I had to guess, I'd say that one's probably hand-entered. This one here, probably a drop-down menu, because it's highly unlikely that someone's going to be so consistent as to choose this, right? Typing that in, probably unlikely, so it's probably a drop-down menu. This one up here, probably hand-entered. So it sort of gives us an impression of how much work are we going to have to do if we want to include that. So again, you can just sort of guess which ones are hand-entered by looking at this and what types of variables there are. OK, so um, here, this is something where literally someone typed in some text. And it looks like it came from our work. So again, this is a great rabbit hole to go down to. When you're looking for stories to tell about your data, the things that people typed in as plain text into an open text box, those are where your stories live. Like the, the numbers and the like histograms and the numerical analysis and the trends, those are all cool. But typically, people are emotionally hooked by personal stories. And these are a really easy way to pick out those personal stories. OK. I think that. Yeah, so hopefully this one is a drop down, not an enter. All right. I think that's the end of that one. And there's one more notebook. This is now we get it. So we did a bunch of work. Question is can we reuse any of that in a future notebook? I'm going to make a claim to you. The answer is yes. Okay, so if I close this up, uh, so this, this thing right here. There wasn't actually anything intrinsic to the data we're looking at in this, this little snippet of code. Right? And so I'm going to make a slight improvement to it and say, like, I'm going to make the claim that it's reusable against other data sets. OK, so I'm going to go through, load all the data as usual, loop over the columns. Right? So now this is just a copy paste from the previous cell. It's the 
first five entries from the data frame for a given column. So we could put that in a function. And here, I've done something slightly different. So I've looked at, uh, rather than the first five values, I look at the most frequent five entries. Yeah. So let's say that this is, this is now a slightly different format. So if I lose someone, please speak up. But it's that same looping through the columns. But instead of just looking at the first five entries, I'm going to look at the most frequent three entries. So when there are uh, three unique entries that happen to capture all the possible entries, there are zero unique entries. Here, there's uh, 900, or 898 unique entries in that column. And the top five most popular ones are those values. So loans for the amount of $10,000 and $12,000. So this function starts to look useful. Like we could reuse this on any data frame. That's good. Okay. So again, this column, this uh, analysis of the data frame, a little bit more automated and gives you a summary of the data a bit more than the describe function would. And I think that's it for that one. So here, employee, employee title. Remember that one? Well, it turns out of those first five columns, those weren't representative. And if you look at the, the US Army, it seems to be the most popular employer for this loan data of 42,000 loans from a long online website. OK. Questions on this? So back to that function that we have. It's just looping over all the columns and counting how many unique entries there are. And then we're looking at the most popular values with just the top however many you want, so in this case, five. OK. Oops. I think that's it for this one. Have we found any bad data? So that's a good question. I think if we go back to the uh, describe function, what I would look at is, um, right, I'd, I'd start that question. If you go back to the sanity checks and you ask, what's the minimum? Like, here, here's the minimum. And the, where's the maximum? There we go, maximum. So you could ask, pretty straightforward, for the loan amount column, is the minimum value of the loan being $7,400 reasonable? Yes. Right, that's just human intuition. Is the maximum loan amount that we see $35,000, is that reasonable? Well, I don't know what type of loans there. I think they're just personal loans. Yeah. Uh, so just for, I think the data source is at the top. Yeah. So, so lendingclub.com is where the data is from. So it, I don't think it's for houses. Yeah. So like the sanity checks, I would just take a look at these uh, columns and the means and the maxes and see, are those valuable or are those reasonable? Sir? In the next slide deck, in the next uh, set of demos, we will talk about a histogram, and that's another way of analyzing whether there are outliers in our data. Okay, so we're going to cruise away from this loan data. Um, just a last note, some columns have no unique entries. Those are the columns that you would probably be interested in dropping because those aren't relevant. And you can see that pretty quickly here. OK. Any questions on the loans before I walk away from that? All right. Baseball, um, this is something I know nothing about. So this is against me. My advice is like analyze data that's in your domain of expertise. Baseball is not in my domain of expertise. But I will show you some baseball anyways, just because that's what I like. I like, so <laughs> I should say, I like making guesses about data and then going off and validating, was well, that a reasonable guess? Right. So you'll see, I, I did that a few times with the loan data. All right. So this data doesn't present any immediate problems with the, uh, the thing of the pandas data frame. There's 2,800 rows and 48 columns, so that's cool. I'll do a quick head to show what are the columns on the left-hand side and the top five 
entries on the, in the columns. OK, so I don't know what any of this means, basically. Like, if, if you look through this and you're a sabermetrician, anyone here a sabermetrician? That's a person who studies numbers and baseball. OK, there's a lot of numbers in baseball. OK, so the good thing is here, we have some mixture of numeric data, which is sort of like the easier of the two to talk, uh, analyze usually. And then there's some strings in here. And so like these strings are where a lot of problems come from, but we'll see um, what to do with those. All right. So when I'm given numeric data, the first thing, well, besides all the things that I showed you, one of the things that I'll jump to is called a histogram. All right. So, uh, oh, sorry, this isn't a histogram yet. We're not there yet. So first, I'm just going to plot the values. So this this plot, let's let's get rank. Let me find that one. Here we go. So this rank value, I literally don't know what it is, but it has a bunch of values in it. So we'll just plot it and see what it looks like. All right. So when I plot it, this is the default in pandas. I take a column of numbers, I plot the values, and so basically on this axis, these are all the the rows, the indices for the rows. And this is the value in the data. And you're like, well, that's not useful. I totally agree with you. Right? That's not useful. Like, what is it doing? It's drawing a bunch of um, lines between every data point. And then when it draws all those lines in, it just fills it in with a bunch of stuff. And it's, it's a mess. Not useful. Okay, if that didn't work out, there's a show command. All right, so the default in pandas for plot is not useful. That's the takeaway point. All right, so it's because these lines are being drawn between consecutive points. And so to avoid those, we'll use the series plot, or sorry, a scatter plot. So rather than try and be clever about connecting the points in the graph, we're just going to plot a point, plot another point, plot another point. And then that will be a little less noisy. Right? So the, this output here was the point and all the lines between them. These are just the, the points. So again, we still have the row index and the numeric value of the cell. Still, this is not useful. Like this, this is a story that I don't know what the story is. There's no story here. OK. So let's see if we can do something smarter than just plot a bunch of values. Because that is cool that we can make plots, but not cool that it doesn't tell a story. OK. So a histogram is slightly different. A histogram asks. How many things are there of a given type? Right? So let's say, how many ones are there? How many twos are there? How many threes are there? How many fours are there? So that type of analysis is slightly more informative than just saying the zeroth entry is a zero, the zeroth, uh, the first entry is a two, the, and the third entry is a three. Right? Like that's also a plot, but it doesn't tell me as much. This here tells me about the distribution of how popular certain elements are. So we can make a guess here that the low value entries, like zeros and ones, those are popular. They show up 850 times. There's a lot of them. Whereas how many 10, 11, and 12 are there? There's like less than 20. So those aren't very popular. So this should sound familiar with that value count operation that we did in pandas. It was saying, like, what are the most popular elements? This is a visual way of accomplishing something similar. Okay. And what did we have to do? We took a column that was numeric, and we did dot hit. That's reasonably straightforward. And now we can be a little bit more clever than that. OK, so yeah, so I should just say, like, pandas does this thing. Oops, I lost that one. Pandas does this thing where when you run this against a column of data, it returns uh, uh, some some content, and the content is both a a variable output and a visual output. And so, in order to suppress this string stuff, I'm polluting my notebook. I'm going to put the output of this command to a variable, but the variable is unnamed. So, if you haven't seen underscore before in Python, it's a little confusing. There is a variable that doesn't have a name. <laughs> Right? That's confusing. So I'm saving the output, but I'm not naming it, which basically means it goes nowhere. So I don't see it, 
on the screen, but I, I can't access it either. Okay, all that did is just say that I'm not. I'm just getting the visual of it. So that's like subtle hit number, subtle, subtle thing to do. Number one. Number two is the default for the hist command is that I put things in ten bins. So you'll notice that there was something like a maximum value between zero and twelve, but hist didn't know that. So it guessed. Well, I'm just going to assume there's ten things. And if there's not, I'll put like zero and one in the one bin, and then like two and three in another bin, and then four in a bin, five in a bin, and I'll get ten bins, but they're not evenly weighted. So that's a bit of a problem. So if I say, well, let's make it a hundred bins, because I don't know how many things there are, right? <laughs> then I get a plot that looks like this. That's almost as used, it's almost as uninformative. It's slightly more informative in the sense that I can tell there's a bunch of things that have value one. There's actually uh, 425 of those, right? A bunch of entries that have a value of two, right, and so on. So you'll notice that's significantly different than the, what we were seeing up here, right? Can someone uh, raise your hand and explain why we're seeing 850 of those? Yeah, so, so the entry, like, just like I said, you have multiple things being smushed into 10 bins, and there are actually 13 things, and so some of those got lumped in together, and so that's why I basically can think of like these entries are being stacked on top of each other. And these two bins are being stacked up. Okay, so the, the thing that this adds though, is that, so we said 100 bins, but it looks like there were only about 13 things. So what it did was it said, well, I'm going to give you a bin from uh, 0 to 0 0.09. I'm going to give you another bin from 0.9 to 0.02, right? and another bin from 0.02 to 0.03. It's going to divide up this space, basically, this line, into 100 little chunks. But the only place where you'll actually get a thing, an entry, is where you have an integer value, because I happen to be applying a, a column that has an integer value. And so in this bin, it's very narrow because like all the other bins around it are zero. So the thing that this tells you is that we have now learned that it's highly likely that this the entries in this column go from zero from one to thirteen. So let's leverage that knowledge. Oh, look at that. <laughs> My guess was right. And I used Python to verify that the number of unique entries in the column is thirteen. All right. I won't ask if you can guess what we're doing there next. All right. So to get an accurate representation of the distribution of values in this data, let's use the number of unique entries as the number of bins. Okay, that, that's reasonably straightforward to do once you understand that that should be something that you should do. <laughs> right. So we take our histogram, we give it the number of unique entries, and then we plot it, and this is a very accurate representation of the distribution of those data. Now we can see not only that, there, so let's contrast this with what we saw here. So initially, when we were just using 10 bins, it looked like there were very few high valued entries, which is a true statement. But now we can make something that's slightly stronger. We can say there were entries that, uh, that there are a small number of high value entries, but there's this 13, which is even smaller than the 12, right? So that's that's cool. And you'll notice it starts smoothing out. So the real data often is pretty smooth. So the smoother, maybe that's a good sign. All right. I didn't reply to you. Yes, OK. Thank you for asking. So initially, this question was, why did we initially see something that looks like this? And the final plot of the histogram looked nothing like this, right? There was a bunch of blue stuff and then less blue stuff. But other than that, we didn't see this big spike. And the reason is because when we only, so the default is to have 10 bins. All right, so if I increase the number of bins to 100, and I over sort of like pop this into two small chunks, I see that there were about 400 entries of with ones in them. And then another 400 with twos in them. So then 
when this sort of smushed them into ten bins, it put all the ones and twos together. So when you when you top basically take the numbers from one to thirteen, divide that into a hundred into ten bins, and it puts the ones and twos together, which is why this is eight hundred. Does that answer the question? Right. So then the last plot. So when we oversampled, we saw the sort of more true nature of our distribution was. But this also isn't. We didn't actually have anything at point at six point one and six point two and six point three and six point four. And so those bins were empty. And so rather than have a bunch of empty bins lying around, we'll say. Make as many bins as there are numbers. And then that's why this this column here, you can't quite see it, but that column is actually just all the ones and this is all the twos and all the threes and all the Okay. So that was all cool. We did some numerical data. We got a histogram. And that's much more expressive than just looking at the most frequent entries or the top three entries, right? Or just looking at the maximum value. So the histogram is a really handy technique for looking at numeric data. It gives you a really good sense of, you know, so you might say the average value is over here, and the max value is up here, and the minimum value is down here. But to look at the histogram is usually much more instructive. Remember, we did that for one column. <laughs> OK. I'm not going to go down the route you think I was going to go down, but we're going to get a different thing. So. Right, so <laughs> let's look at another column called AB. So I'm going to scroll up to the top here. We're almost to a break point. Uh, so we can find AB quickly. There we go. OK, so again, I don't know what AB is, and I don't know what rank is, but I'm just going to use them. So, so this is a nickel column here, and it's got a bunch of entries. So let's look at that. Right. So if I if I use that same trick that I used before of taking as many unique entries, and I'm gonna have as many bins as there are unique entries, the resulting plot is computationally expensive. It took two seconds to render. And it sort of went in the opposite direction. Remember when we sampled a hundred bins and there were only ten things, it wasn't super descriptive. Um, and again here. You, you, you could get some value here of like this is the maximum and the average is probably about here and then there's a minimum down there. And so, like, this could be instructive, but um, I would argue against it. It's often slightly better to like have a lower number of bins because our human brain is not very good at weighting these little points down. So, um, if we reduce, so this is where you get to play as a data scientist and figure out what looks pretty, basically. And this is very subjective. So in my estimation, it's slightly better to have a lower number of bins rather than the actual number of unique bins. And this plot looks a little bit more representative of the data. Like it's not sort of focused on so much like every single detail, and your eye sort of like realizes there's a bunch of stuff down here. So, no, so it's it's reducing the number of bins to cluster things together. So it's almost the opposite of what we we're doing before. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so to answer that question, we're going to start at the top again. So his question is like, what are the axes? So when we did a scatter plot, the scatter plot just used the value in the column and the index of the row. So here we have the row index and the value of the column. When we do a histogram, that's not the case. So a histogram asks the question, how many ones are there? How many twos are there? How many threes are there? How many fours are there? So this axis, you can think of, this is the actual value represented. This is how many instances of that value are there. So when we come down to this, uh, what we're looking at is how many values in that data frame have the value 5,000? And here it's something like five. How many rows have the value 5,500? Quite a few. Again, whether that makes sense or not depends on how well you know baseball, but 
basically this is this axis here is telling you how many of there are of this thing. Right, it's a subjective thing. So you can oversample and you can undersample whether those are telling the story that the reader should see. That's up to what the story. Okay. Oh, yeah. So the last one here is on categorical data. So this is what I was sort of saying when there's two things and there's a yes, no, we can think of those as a binary choice. And so therefore, it makes sense to use a bar plot, a bar diagram. This is not a histogram. It's categorical data on this axis. And we're counting how many no's are there and how many yeses are there. So this is like, there can be more than two categories. Maybe there's like dogs and cats and birds and horses. And those are your four categories. And you want to count how many dogs are there, how many cats are there, how many horses are there, how many birds are there. So this is another standard plot for numerical data or categorical data. Okay. Oh yeah. So then I, there is a use for scatter plots. I, I started out with that. I'm gonna end with it. So one of the the rows here is a year. So this is a year, and then I'm just gonna plot another random column against that. So here I'm plotting the year as the x-axis and the BPF, whatever that is, as the y-axis. And then like, how does that value change over time? So that's where you would use a scatter plot. Time values that are Unrelated in sequence. Okay, and now it's time for a break. Come back at eight. Yes. Up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right here. This one? So what are you trying to do as a Oh I was I was measuring how it takes the plot. So like when I oversample when I said like plot as many bins as there are uh, entries in that column, it took two seconds to render this plot. Oh, because for me, whenever something exceeds about point one seconds, and then I wonder how long did that take? So this is just my curiosity of like how long it takes. So this takes in Python two seconds to run. And here when I when I decrease the number of bins to only one hundred, then it's rendering about ten times as fast. And I don't get much gain if I undersample. And so again, not super relevant. There are only something like twelve hundred entries. But if there's a thousand entries or sorry, ten thousand entries, then time of rendering starts to matter more. It's for time dot time variable Yeah. And then when you print it, yeah. use the same function time is variable. Store the same function. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, so, so think of think of the time dot time as asking what time is it right now? Okay. And it's gonna get you back in your market life. So, so let me let me just run that quick. I'll do that up here. Oops. Uh, why you, oh, I can't run that apparently. And that take Oh yeah. Well, there it came back. Okay. So that's time. That time returns the numeric value. And when I run that command again, so let's say I, I'm going to execute this cell and watch the numbers. Well, I'll actually, a new cell. So that the time increased slightly, so by something like a hundred seconds, no, yeah. twenty seconds. Sorry, so it increased by twenty seconds. And so if I measure the elapsed time, it's if I want to subtract this from that. Yeah. Oh, uh, no, I don't care. Yeah. 
So, so I want so when a function is called, it often returns something. And by default, when I call a function and it returns a thing, if I don't store that to a variable, it will just get printed to screen. So where that comes into play down here. Right. So I re I called this function, and that function returned both this and the visualization and this comment. Huh? And you did not store it anywhere. Correct. It just got printed to the screen. But when I uh, let's see if I can. I'm sure. Right. So so when I store it to an underscore, I'm saying store this to a variable rather than printing it to the screen. But don't name what the variable is. So let's say we just saw that there is uh, we write two lines uh -huh. with the same underscore variable. So does that mean it will replace the DF graph? So let's say if you run this, yeah. the result of I'm sure you're on this. The result of underscore would be a string elements instead of uh, no, so it's it's gonna so remember that the DF rank hist returns both uh, output variable and the visualization, and, and so that that string is being stored to a nameless variable, and so out of that cell, there's still a visual output. Wait, I don't yeah. 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 But there is no name to the variables. It's just like being written to nothing. I don't know Java well enough to say that. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty. I'm reason. I'm curious. I don't think it does anything, but we'll see. <laughs> Next. Okay. <laughs> that I have not played with, so I don't know. Well, something like Google for it, but all right, we have people back, so we will get started. All right. So at this point, we have an activity. The activity involves you writing code. The code that you'll be writing, I've already started for you. And the code is available in Blackboard, so you will have to go into Blackboard, download the zip file, extract the zip file, open the Python notebook in Jupyter, and then do the exercise. All right, so this is solo work. Once you finish, go find some good map. Question. What do you need? By, what was the first part of the question? Bins? Yes. You're changing the visualization. Yes. You haven't changed anything in the data frame. Is that was that the question? Okay. Yeah. The data the data frame is untouched. Okay. So if you have trouble finding this course material, let me know. It's in the course materials week four data cleanup directory, and then there's a zip file in there. There is.
When you have questions and are confused, let me know and raise your hand and I'll ponder them. If you don't have the Python notebook open at this point, uh, raise your hand. No.
resume. We've got a bit more content to go through, so come back to your desk. So if, if you didn't complete this exercise, I'd strongly recommend completing it outside of class. And the reason I say that is because histograms and scatter plots and bar charts are very useful things for project one. Right? So we covered a lot of content today. It's in the lecture notes. The notebooks that were presented will be posted to Blackboard. Those will be useful for you when you're doing project one, your analysis on your data. Right? OK, so did anyone set the x-axis labels and y-axis labels on their charts? Got one? Yeah? All right, two? Awesome. All right, so let's do that quick. So on my histogram, I have two axes, right? an x-axis and a y-axis. This is the abscessa and abscessa. I forget the names. but. So basically, I'm going to use plt.xlabel uh, rank values and plt.ylabel account. So when I do that, I'm going to hide that output. So when I do that, I get back. 
some labels on my axes, and that makes the plot much easier to read. So I strongly recommend labeling your axes, especially for the project, because I do great on that. OK. So I'm going to wander through a bunch of content, and then we'll get to a homework, and we will leave on time at 940. All right. So first thing that I wanted to show you, I can pull up this page. All right. So if you remember that, the, can I get your attention? Thanks. So when I when I plotted the scatter plot, you saw something that looked like this. It is a blob of data with a bunch of large points. And that's cool that you plotted a thing, but the plot isn't very descriptive about what's going on. So this is an important sort of distinction of, is this visualization good enough, is a very subjective question. But from a reader's perspective, the question they're asking is, does this, story, does this data tell a story? And in this answer, the answer is probably no. OK. So let's go through a couple different iterations of the same data set, but visualized completely differently. And you'll see how much of a difference it makes. So the first thing is, let's change the dot size to be way smaller. And you'll notice how much of a difference that makes. Right? It's very clear compared to this one. That one is just like a giant blob with like a couple things going on. This one, it's pretty clear that so there's different edges and boundaries for those groupings. All right, we've already made progress just by changing the size of the dot. That was super easy. And look at this website. It, it gives you the code. Amazing. It's almost like I want you to succeed. Whew. All right. Okay, does transparency help? Nah. Not really. It's not really a great value add there. Density, so this is a different density plot of the same data, so it's drawing some boundaries rather than individual points. It looks cooler. Does it tell the story? Eh, whatever. Like It depends on your audience. All right, this is another trick. Rather than plotting all the points, maybe it's sufficient just to plot a subset of the points. And that's another way of reducing the density of your data. OK, filtering, um, you can change the color per group. right? So maybe you want to highlight the fact that this group, those are our customers, those are the two people, those are our enemies, maybe, I don't know, whatever. Right? Color coding helps. Grouping by color, OK. And then like you could just put the different groups on different plots. And maybe that draws out the fact that there are different layouts. And maybe not, I don't know. OK, jitter, probably not super useful. This is where everybody gets stuck. As soon as they figure out you can do three-dimensional visualizations, people go crazy. It's, it's very reliable, right? Students discover this, they're just like, that's the answer. 3D, right? It's clearly better. And my answer is it's almost never better. It looks pretty. And if that's the goal, then totally do 3D plots. Color 3D plots are very pretty. <laughs> but they almost always obfuscate the story, right? This looks pretty to the eye, but as far as like distinguishing that data com compared to something that looks more like uh, this, this is a little bit more clear. Right? It's, it's, it's <laughs> this is pretty, but don't get distracted. These other ones have just as much or more value because they're easy to read. This is a very fancy plot. So it goes, it combines a couple different ideas. So the same thing with, I think it was the, the density plots here. And then like it does sort of like a side view rather than a top view. So this is a cool plot if you want to show off and look, make it look like you're a statistician. OK. So those were a couple different ways of the same data set and with all the code presented to you. So that should make your life easier. All right. So then that sort of like gets overwhelming because there's so many choices. So what is Ben's guide to like making your visualization the best it can be? And the answer is, use less ink. So wh what does that mean? All right, so um, so let's, let's work with this data set. It's relatively simple. And basically, it's an animation of every single choice that they can make, which uses less ink, they make for you. And they're stepping through all the choices. And they talk about how the, the choices are being made here. Um, ignore these parts, obviously. But they're trying to convince you that the more information you can pack into less ink, the easier it will be for your audience to understand the story being told. Remember, this is the original plot. 
they're basically taking away all the things that, that distract you from the actual story. That's the value. Right? If you can cram more information with less ink, we have a higher density story, people are going to be able to access the decision-making information faster, and there'll be more value for them. So that first initial plot has a lot of things like shading and colors, and like, but those are distractions. So get rid of the distractions. Okay. So let's just one more time. So that's the initial starting point, right? Get rid of everything. All right. So those links are in the notebooks, obviously. I would suggest looking at that code and trying to internalize the concept of blessing. All right. So this is uh, my last few sort of like walkthrough slides. We'll sort of breeze through quickly in order to get to the homeworks. Um, this is a joke. I'll give you a minute. <laughs> All right, that was a joke for class. Um, so when you're presented with incomplete data, which you very often will be, um, you have to figure out what choice is appropriate. And I can't tell you what the right choice is. So again, I need you to be a human and make decisions about your data set that a computer just cannot make. Right? Pandas gives you the tools to implement those decisions, but you will be in charge of figuring out what the right answer is. And there's a whole field in mathematics dedicated to this problem. So I certainly can't cover it in the last remaining 10 minutes. But I'm not even going to try, right? Like, this is a whole field. Like, go get your math degree, I guess, or statistics degree. All right, I'm going to try and like <laughs> breeze through a couple of here. Might be faster than I like, but uh, what was it? Empty entries one. Correct. All <laughs> all we've done so far is detect that there are problems. <laughs> right. Okay. I agree with you. <laughs> All right, so so back to our loans data, which is our now favorite set of data. It's very large compared to what we've been working with so far. We load it in, we look at it, and we recognize there's a bunch of these NAN things, not a number. So that means that there was a cell, like a, a row and column location, but there wasn't a value in there. And so pandas does the great thing and fill it in for you with a placeholder indicating that there wasn't a thing there. That's a little confusing. Not a number is a thing. <laughs> okay. So going through that, we also see there's like ends. Those are actually strings. Here's a bunch of data. Okay, blah, blah, blah. Now these columns here, these look suspect. I'm just looking at like the top few column, uh, top two, the top few rows. But there are things that start out with a whole bunch of NANs. So that's sort of an indicator that I suspect, just based on my intuition, that there's probably not much data in there. Like, those are things that we can get rid of. So it, even though there's 145 columns, a lot of these might be empty. OK, so this is a quick, easy question. How many uh, columns have nothing in them? Right. And, and so like, this is the column rows. Basically, some of the columns, I'm going to scroll over here. These are, it drops off. But how many are null? I can ask, how many null entries are there in a given column? Right. And so then I can see, like, oh, there is as many null values as there are rows. That's good. All right. So I'm just doing some sort of statistics to count how many null entries are. Now look at that. Remember all those NANs? These are correlating to all the entries being NANs. So that sort of makes me feel better, because I'm going to go ahead and drop those. They don't have any information in them. Okay, so initially, now this is me just sort of like being very pedantic. There's 42,000 rows in my data frame. And I want to ask, are all of the entries in that column empty? And if the answer is yes, then I'm probably going to get rid of those. All right, so there's as many null entries as there are rows, then we're probably going to do something with that. Okay, so all these trues, we're going to have to get rid of those. Yeah. So then go through and uh, walk through that pretty quickly. But I'm looping over all of the columns. This is sort of similar to the notebooks that we did previously. Uh, we're just looping over all of the things in a series. And if it's truly empty, 
we're going to drop that column along the rows, and we're going to do it within the existing data frame. So we're actually going to change the data frame structure. So that words, after we've dropped all the empty entries, we now only have 64 columns. We started off with 145. And we can do the same thing. Yeah. So you can ask, like, what's the ratio of nulls? So this is sort of like a an analysis of like how many entries were there. there. So how many missing entries were there for the percent? So these are just games you can play. You can sort these as a series. And then yeah. So that the, the, the fun thing to do is like pick out the outliers, right? So there are entries only three rows that have something wrong with them. So maybe those are rows worth investigating more. So you can actually check them and see what's in them. So here, we noticed that the three rows where there was only one entry and everything else was NAND, those had something that was wrong with them. Like sometimes everything is NAND, and then that's just a drop. So sometimes there's like just a few things that aren't NAND, and you aren't really inspect those. You look the kind of yeah. That means there's some additional cleaning required. Okay. Blah blah blah. Yeah. So so the outcome of all this analysis was the ID column that I thought was a thing isn't actually a thing. It was more of a note for the person inserted in a new column. Yeah. I think uh, yeah. that's all I'll do with this. I'd recommend reading through this, but there's a lot of Analysis here of NANs and what to do about them. Yeah, and sparseness. All right. So all of this was sort of a very numerical based analysis. That's not the way most people operate. They're mostly visual. So we'll do a quick visual analysis. The, the visual library that I've sort of discovered and enjoyed is called Missing NO. So this is a, a yet another library in my toolbox. And again, remember. This is sort of like what the contents look like. And then I get to the pretty part. So this is a visual overview of the matrix. Right. So the, the first 25, actually not the sampling of the random selection, but there are 25 rows of data, and then these are the columns. And the black entries are things where there is a value, and the white things is where there's nothing. So remember, previously we were seeing like things where there's a bunch of NANs and where the null is true, right? But this is the same idea, but visually. And the value here is it's much quicker to say like, well, when, I, when I drop all these columns, there's still gonna be some issues here. Yeah, uh, I think I have a note for myself. Somewhere. Yeah, so th this is called a spark line. And the spark line, just to get this right, is the general shape of the data completeness. So. So the point here is if you had uh, columns that were always filled or always empty, that'd be a, a flat spark line on this side. But the fact that you have some entries, some, some columns that have entries and some that don't, is more of a mess there. Right? And so like this is more jagged and just counting the number of columns you have in your data. Okay. So you can sort of make this bigger to sample more of your data and gets kind of interesting. So there, there are some columns here. I've blown this up now as 250 randomly selected rows in my data. And I can see that there are some columns that have a lot of empty entries, but not always. And then there are some entries that like really here, I need to figure out why is this thing missing an entry? If that column is important, and maybe it's not, and I'll ignore it. But sometimes I need to dip dive in and figure out why is there a missing entry. I think that's it. Yeah, so then you can also, after you do the same thing of dropping the, the empty data, then you can go back and reinspect and see how, how your data recovered off that. So here, what we see is we got a bunch of em empty rows, but then there were uh, columns that had like one entry. So we need to go back and revisit what's in that outlier there. Which column is that? And you have to figure that out using the numerical analysis. Okay, so then all I've talked about so far is dropping empty columns and rows. That's like a very brute force way of reducing your data set. And it's 
it usually uh, gets you something that's easier to work with mentally. That's how you spend time doing it. And it leaves you with just the problems you have to fix. Sometimes you want to replace those man values with something else that's numeric. And that may be depending on, like, if I want to do a scatter plot or a bar chart where it needs numeric data and it can't handle bands. So I want to force it into being numeric. But I want to indicate that it's not something that's realistic. Maybe I intentionally insert data that's wrong in order to do further analysis on it, but still uh, mark it as something that I need to go back and investigate. So the other, this is a, a reasonably advanced trick. I think I'll force you on, but remember we did a histogram, so it shows you a shape of the variable distribution. We can use that knowledge to fill in missing values. So that means like if my uh, distribution, and I have some variable where like most of the values are five, but there are some values that are low and a lot of values that are also low up here. And this is the comp. So rather than randomly replacing values with a fixed entry or with some other random value, maybe what I do is I sample from this distribution. So most of the time, I'll replace a NAN with a five. But a few times, I'll replace it with a value that's higher. And sometimes, I'll replace it with lower. But that's it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, want to, so you want to maintain the shape of the distribution when you're repairing it. So if you were, so let's say I had this as the distribution, and every time I saw an empty value, I inserted the value of eight. Like every time. Right? The consequence of that is my distribution would start to look like this. Right? I'd have the original data, but then I'd be screwing up the distribution of values by introducing a value that's just eight. That wouldn't be very realistic. But that goes back to having a good understanding of what is your actual distribution shape look like without any empty values. Okay, so that's one technique. Right. The other technique that's pretty common is interpolation. So remember that bowling data that we looked at a few weeks ago? And the data sort of looked like uh, sort of a count and a year. And it went up like this, right? So there, addition, and filling in the distribution of values wouldn't make any sense. Since we know it's a time value here, we can reasonably guess that this is probably those points, right? So you, one way to do it is just like visually check and see, oh yeah, that's probably what it is. But Pandas does this for you. It has this interpolate function. And it will fill in missing values based on the adjacent entries. That's exciting. Makes your life way easier. All right. And then there's all these like tuning variables that like you can say like interpolate from the nearest neighbor or interpolate from the nearest five neighbors. All right. That gets pretty complicated. All right. So example anomalies. I'm gonna skip over this section. It's not super important for you, I think, um, but it goes back to something that you may see out in the real world where you're looking at text data. How do you do cleaning of text data? All right, so finding anomalies data is something that I'll skip over at this point. Um, but the point here is that just like in distributions of numbers, we can look at like how frequently does this number appear? We can also ask how often does this word appear? How often does this letter appear? And if you know that E is the most popular language, most popular letter in the English language, then you can say, does my data correlate to that representation? Hopefully, right? Just like the word the shows up very often, so you'd expect the to show up in text very often. All right, then the last one here is numbers. So the numbers have this weird property called Benford's Law. Definitely recommend it. Uh, there's some great stories about people trying to create fake data, and then they didn't know about Benford's Law, and so the fake data they created didn't adhere to this property where the number one shows up more often than number two, and the number two shows up more often than number three. And so when you're using fake data, you don't get that property, usually, unless you know that they're going to look for that. All right, outliers, anomalies, blah, blah, blah. All right, homework. Three minutes. All right. <laughs> so the, the plan with the homework, it should have been with last week because it basically uses beautiful soup, but it's cool. You still know beautiful soup. All right.
So I'll let you read this over. Basically, we have an HTML file, but it's embedded in an XML document. It's a mess. I mean, seriously, I, I really apologize for inflicting this on you, but it's been done so many times, I just feel I have to do it to you. Paint. Yeah, so usual instructions, write down on paper what I want you to do, and then try and break it into steps and do that. And there's a bunch of device that we won't have time for. Okay. All right, so the, the two minutes is for you to read this and ask me questions, because I'm here. And if you ask me questions now, I'm way likely to like share the answer with the entire class. I'm trying to incentivize you to ask questions. No, I'm just from this. <laughs> like a library so this is a pro tip i don't know if you guys remember but back in lecture one i actually gave you a notebook that has xml parsing in it so it'd be a great place to start I thought that's the answer. That's not the answer, by the way. But <laughs> <laughs> it's a useful thing to know how to parse XML, right? Wait, wait. We have a question. Hold up. No. What's the question? <laughs> You'll have to use Python to analyze data. Someone else, question. We got one more minute. I can dance for it. It consists of all the text like CRTD. Every bunch of it or it's a mixture of XML and HTML. So remember, the basic structure of XML is a tag and then some content and a closed tag. Right? And then you have more tags, and inside some of those XML tags is. All right, got it. <laughs> it isn't easy. <laughs> All right. So what will be your response? Start early, design a solution, then implement it. <laughs> and ask me what I'm available by email. I say about importing the numbers and links. So basically we just print it for the number and then hands and that Yeah. Okay, class has ended. You're welcome to sit in your seats. What is your design? I think you understand the problem. Now the question is, what step will you take to do that? All right. I think yeah. So I would recommend reading through the slides. There's a couple of tips in there. Beautiful soup and parsing XML is not the answer. I, I've tried it. So many students. <laughs> well, what, what was that? I'm very I'm still not sure how I'm going to clean my project data. So, like, I'm not giving an example.
some of the years are missing, then the question becomes is the CSD in order? You could interpolate the years, would it make sense to interpolate the years? Would it make sense to